days. Since I've been here, I've heard that these are the best days out of the whole year, even though it's a little extra work, but I love that we get to be a little bit closer today. We get to see each other's faces. So I wanna invite you to stand and sing with us. Let's sing a little extra louder today as we respond to God for who he is and what he's done for us. And let's just enjoy this time that we get to be together. to come before you and put our trust in you and our hope in you and Lord that you hear us and you comfort us and you're always with us 
you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, would you like to turn around and say good morning to someone and make them feel welcome and maybe ask them what their Halloween costume is? Or you can talk about the game if you don't like to wear costumes. foods smothered in gravy because, well, I think gravy makes everything better. And here at Kensington, we have an opportunity to bring Thanksgiving dinner to families in need from our local school partners. I want to invite you to join us in this nearly three decade long tradition that I personally have loved being a part of, Thanksgiving baskets. Now Thanksgiving baskets, they provide families with everything they need to celebrate the holiday meal. Now, in recent years, we've replaced the actual turkey and all the fixins with a gift card because this allows families to make their own special recipes when celebrating together. So for every $50 donation, one family will receive a Thanksgiving bag packed with paper goods, lots of love, and a gift card. Together, we can all make Thanksgiving special by generously loving our neighbors. So join us, grab some friends, your kids, and come be a part of this special Thanksgiving tradition. You can donate or sign up to deliver the bags by visiting kensingtonchurch.org slash Thanksgiving. And if you call Kensington home and are in need this year, please give our offices a call. Now, I don't know about you, but my dinner table after Thanksgiving is always a big old mess. I mean, it starts out looking really pretty. I mean, the plates and the silverware, they're all perfectly in place, and there's some sort of fall decor in the center of the table. But over the course of the meal, I mean, food is dropped, and bowls lay empty, and gravy is spilled, and things just will end up in utter disarray. But that never bothers me, because the time around the table is not about whether it stays clean. It's about gathering with loved ones and celebrating. And the tables in our lives can be a place of joy, community, shared laughter, and love. But they can also be a place of exclusion. I mean, does anyone remember that feeling of anxiety when you'd enter into the school cafeteria at lunch and wonder, where do I sit? When you think about it, there are so many aspects of our life that happen around a table. And much of what Jesus taught also happened around tables, whether reclining by a table and having a friendly chat with his disciples or breaking bread with them in the upper room. Tables were a significant piece in the life and teachings of Jesus. So imagine with me for just a moment, what if a symbol of our lives was a table? What would it reveal? Is your table a place of welcome? Do you prefer a table for one? Can people come be their messy selves at your table? Is your table a neglected place? Could your table be a space where you serve others and connect with God? Next week, we begin a new four-week series on how Jesus used tables as a place for connection, conversation, and conviction, while we discover what that could mean for us personally. So join us next Sunday for our new series, Table Talks. But first, let's wrap up our current series growing, which we are so glad that you are here for today. Welcome, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so we skipped this in rehearsal today, but um, I'm just going to go ahead and start with, it's Justin Warren's birthday. Oh. <laughs> oh, no, that so was sweet. so good. Yes, thank I you. thought I was going to have to be like, Who come on, come on. Who loves being the center of attention on your birthday? Come on, you, raise your hand, because oh. you love the center. 
Okay, yeah. Yeah, everyone else is like, this is the worst moment I could ever imagine, right? Okay, just checking. My husband's one of those people that's like, don't tell anyone it's my birthday. And I'm like, Brandon. five days till my birthday, four days till my birthday. <laughs> oh, so good. All right. So uh, before, um, I was actually thinking about this um, last night as Henry Dupin, as you, many of you know, Clint Michael Dupin helped launch Kensington, Birmingham. And last year when Michigan State won, I brought Henry and Clint on stage and decked them out in Michigan State gear. It was one of the greatest moments of my life. <laughs> Henry was texting me from 12 uh, midnight to 1 a.m., trash talking me this year, getting me back for all of it. Well done to our U of M fan. Okay. Yeah. Take your moment. Congratulations Enjoy on it. the Paul Bunyan trophy for this year only. All right, so we do have a few announcements that we wanted to share with you. One of those, I just want to reiterate the Thanksgiving basket tradition here at Kensington. It is one of my favorite things that, that we do. And part of it is, uh, for me, when I was a kid, my family, this is one of the first ways we actually got involved in the church. Like we didn't really spend time in the church. That wasn't my upbringing. But there was something about uh, serving our brothers and sisters around us that uh, brought my family to join in. And so I would encourage you as a family, it's a great opportunity, uh, whether you're being generous uh, with your finances or also with your time and being a part of those moments, really encourage you to sign up and do that. I know for our family, it's a, it's a favorite tradition that we do with our kids and do it as a community. Yes, I love Thanksgiving baskets. Okay, and then the other thing that we wanted to talk about today is on November 20th, which is our first week back in the auditorium, uh, it is baptisms. So we are very excited. Over the last year, we have baptized 22 people mm -hmm. in the Birmingham community. And baptism is this public declaration of your decision to follow Jesus. So this is like, they, they don't like when I say this, whoever they are, but it Who is the they? Super Bowl of church things <laughs> you can do. <laughs> baptism day is, I, it's one of the most special things that you can do. And for me, I honestly, like when people go into the water and come back out, I cannot have that moment without tears. It is the most yeah. beautiful thing that you can do as a Christian to um, have that outward declaration of your faith. So please join us that day and please just prayerfully consider if you should be getting baptized. Yeah, it's a powerful, powerful thing that we love sharing stories of. Um, so um, there are these times as a community where we have what we call a family chat, where we give an update, and everyone loves family chats. They're like, oh, no. <laughs> so um, we wanted to have a little bit of a family chat uh, and share an update uh, about our team. And um, one of the things that uh, has been happening in this past season, especially we were talking about it this morning, is in this growing series, how it reminds us of some of those next steps that we're called to. And so Erin is going to share a little bit of an update about her and her family. <laughs> All right. So it is with a very heavy heart that I, uh, that I, that I announce that I will be leaving staff. Um, but the great news is that I'm being called to something amazing, and I don't know what that is yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we are actually, we've put the mark, our house on the market, and we're headed to Kentucky. Um, I've got about 30 family members in and around the Cincinnati area, and I was born there, and we left approximately three weeks later. I spent every Christmas traveling to Cincinnati until I was married, and now all of a sudden we're empty nesters, and I feel like I'm being called to go live out kind of my childhood dream of being where my family is. My son's in Texas, he's always going to be a flight away. My daughter's at University of Kentucky, mm. so she'll be about an hour and a half away. And I think that God is going to strategically place us in Kentucky exactly where he wants to use us. So I'm very excited about what is next. But with that being said, um, I am newer to this community and you have welcomed me with the, with the most open arms. Mm. Um, you've showed nothing but love, and you're on the top of the list of things that it will be hard to leave. I don't know. I'm sorry. Can we give her a big... <laughs> what I... 
Uh, we have wept as a team, so you can weep with us. Uh, we have shed tears of sadness and joy because part of our conversation, just to give a little color to the story too, is your brother who retired from the military retired into Cincinnati. Your parents moved to Cincinnati in the last three months. And my kids left for college. And kids left for college. They're, so, <laughs> wah, yeah. wah, wah. so part of it is we're, we're weeping because we're sad. She's been an absolute gift to our community. Uh, but we're also joyful in the fact of what she's being called into, and that's part of the kingdom. Uh, there are beautiful and painful moments that happen at the same time, and that's one of these. And so, and she's doing it in such an honoring way. She actually uh, gave her, her notice that she isn't leaving till January. Uh, so it's a long, what do you, what'd you call it? I said, this is not like a quick peace out. This is like a long Midwest goodbye. You know? <laughs> I am going to take my time, walk into the car. We'll have lots of conversations on the way. We'll hug a couple times. Yeah. It, will, it will be amazing. So can we, would you join me in praying for the Brissette family and then also praying for whoever is the next person that says, yes, this is the, the place I want to be at in this next season and help lead as a campus director. And then just real fast okay. before you pray. Um, okay, if you're going anywhere other than Ohio, you're going to drive through Kentucky. <laughs> That's right. This is my open invitation to all of you that you are always, always welcome at my table. Sincerely, I know that I have welcomed many of you into my home here and that will not stop because I'm moving. So if you take 75 past the river yeah. the in moment Cincinnati, you cross over. once you cross over, you are in my territory <laughs> and you are welcome for dinner. You can spend the night for all I care. I'm, let's do it. All right, would you join me? Jesus, thank you so much for Aaron and the gift of leadership and love that she has been to our community. Thank you for um, just all that she has given, how she has broken her heart for our community and, uh, and poured out um, so much. Uh, thank you for her character as she is so kind to us as a community to give us time and walk with us and go above and beyond. We pray for their family in this transition. And then, Lord, we pray for the open door for the next person to say yes. And uh, whoever you have already placed on their heart uh, an opportunity to join us. So we lift these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you uh, for uh, being a part of this moment with us. And, and I would encourage you to give a word of encouragement to Erin. Stop her in the hallway. Uh, it is, she has been an absolute uh, treasure and gift, and we will keep weeping together. Um, so we're going to jump into our series back this uh, week five of Obeying. So to do that, to set that tone, one of the things we wanted to do is uh, let the band lead us in a song that kind of uh, prepares our hearts for week five of the Growing series.
Now the plant, leafy and rooted, displays the most beautiful growth yet, the flowering that comes with loving God. The sweet sap of love is running through the plant in bubbling, joyful rivers, and blossoms are bursting forth with color, fragrance, and unmatched beauty. Every twig now adorned and breathtaking. I love this series growing. It's been a, a joy. And if we haven't met, my name is Justin. Uh, I get to lead this campus, and it's been um, it's been home for us. It's been a place of connection and community, and and beautiful moments to be shared. And I was thinking about as we're in this room, uh, in this gym. If some of you, this is your first week in the gym, welcome. It's one of my favorite weeks of the year. Uh, it's it's seriously one of the places that I find things change and shift. And and when we're in these spaces, we experience maybe a new uh, a new seat. How many of you had to change seats and that was a frustration for you? Yeah, you're like, I, I know where I sit. And I know the people around me. We have that eye connection agreement during the handshake. We just go, and that's it. You know, you have those moments. You like things a certain way. And uh, so that's why I love this place. And But this growing series is this beautiful conversation that we've been having about what does growth look like in our lives, in our spiritual lives, and in the ways that we desire to live. And I love that one line. It says, I don't want to miss a moment. I have that feeling all the time. It's, I don't want to miss a moment. I want to be present with my kids. I want to be present in the moments that are joyful. I want to skip past the moments that are painful. But I, I don't want to miss what God might be doing in my life. And for some of us, when we hear those lyrics, we're, we may be a little bit in tension. Like, is that true? Is that, is that really the kind of love that I desire? Or, or is there something else? And I just feel this obligation just weighing me down. So I don't know when you think about the word duty or obligation or obedience, what you think about, but one of the things I think about is the worst ideas ever in my life. Uh, I was thinking about one time, uh, I, one of my friends, when we decided to buy our house and we bought this house that needed a lot of work, uh, at the time it was, uh, we had gone through 80 homes at the time uh, to look for the home that we would e eventually end up in and, and uh, it, it had these nice 1965 cabinets that didn't even have backs on them. Uh, the doors started falling off. The, the, the person, when they were walking through, and I, like, I judged myself a little bit. They're like, yeah, this dishwasher right here, it's great. It doesn't work. Uh, this is uh, broken. That's fake. That's not going to, but you're probably going to have to replace all these things. And I'm like, okay, I have the duty and obligation to make this place better. And so I decided what any wise individual would do, I became the general contractor on my own home knowing nothing about general contracting. And I remember like one of my buddies telling me, he's like, you got this. And I'm like, I do. He was wrong. <laughs> okay? Like he was wrong. He's like, it'll be fun. It wasn't. He goes, you'll be able to save money. I disagree. <laughs> like all of the things fell apart in this whole experience. And the moral of the story is, especially when you do this when your wife is pregnant, it is a bad idea. The water was turned on four days before our first child's due date. Let me tell you, there was a lot of conversations that were not fun that were happening in my household for uh, many, many months. But then there's those moments when you have a friend. And what's so funny, uh, as I was thinking about something different than this, I was thinking about a friend of mine who bought a house during the pandemic. And I was thinking about, what do you do out of duty and obligation when it's actually rooted in love? When it's not just I have to do a task because it's the requirement, but I, I want to do it out of love. One of my friends ended up buying a house during the pandemic, and, and uh, I remember us being, I remember vividly, because I hold it over him out of love. Um, we spent two weeks from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. working on that house. It was out of love. There was no greater moment than leaving my house at 10 p.m. 
to go serve him and his family because of the chaos that was in their life? Why do we willingly sacrifice time, energy, finances, and sleep? We don't do it out of duty. We do it out of love. And that's this series that we are in. We're talking about growing, and we're coming into this conversation of love. And when I think about this community, when I think about the things that we have been a part of, the Thanksgiving baskets that we talked about, the ways that we've served and partnered in schools, the ways that many of you have been on short-term trips to our global partners, the ways in which we want to have an impact in the world and not say it's about four walls or a gym set up or an auditorium, but it's about having an impact that is beyond the walls. We do it not out of duty. We do it out of love. And sometimes what happens in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of our lives, we have to be reminded of that. Because sometimes, for me, I get selfish, I get focused on just the moment and the things that I want, but the actions that are response out of love are different. They remind us that we belong to one another, as Mother Teresa says. She says, when we forget that we belong to one another, we forget our humanity in one another. We forget the ways that we can love and serve one another. We forget what Jesus calls us to. And I would say this is what is one of my favorite things about Jesus that transcends all of the cultural conversation, that transcends all of our frustrations, that transcends our anxiety and our hurts and our pains and our baggage, even with the church. What happens is Jesus reminds us that we belong to one another and we're called to experience love together. And we serve one another, not out of duty, but out of love. So I'm not a crier. It's not like I haven't, I haven't been a crier, but if you give me an American's Got Talent episode with a golden buzzer, <laughs> I am like addicted to weeping as I watch beautiful stories of humanity unfold. I, it's like my kids even called me out and they're like, Dad, you never cry. I was like, well, America Got Talent video, I will. <laughs> right? Like, because there's something beautiful that connects with our soul. And I think that is what Jesus, as he meets us in the middle of this growing series, is doing. To connecting us to something more beautiful, more powerful, more transformative. So why don't we pray? Jesus, thank you for this time. And maybe we come in to this place and we've, we've carried burdens, we've carried obligations, we've carried duty as the d driving factor in our lives and we felt the shame and guilt and all the things in between. Would you break down that in our hearts? And would you speak to us about the best that you have? In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna take a moment and receive our offering. Um, and uh, I, I just wanna say this, if you're new here, we're just so glad that you're a part of this community, you stepped into this place, maybe you're just visiting. Um, our offering is the way that we partner, not only with what's happening here, but around the world. So our usher's gonna come forward and you have an opportunity to give in the, in the bags that they have there or online. Um, I know for me, that's been my journey is uh, moving from uh, cash and check to online because I never showed up with anything because that was me, and I love uh, automation, and it's one of my favorite things. Uh, but I would say whatever you give, if you decide to, uh, I just want to say thank you. You are part of stories and people's lives that are far beyond this place, and it is a joy to be in that with you. You get to have an impact around the world, and uh, locally and globally, and it's just a joy. So here, we're going we're gonna to go get started with our growth concept, come back, kind of Put the growth chart up on here. These have been our five weeks of our journey. We talked about in the first week, believing in God. When we talked about that word believing, is more like trusting. It's an act of trust. Believing is not just thoughts about something, but it's the willingness to trust and move in a direction. Tatiana led us in the second week around seeking. And the idea of seeking that she brought us to was this place of seeking without shame. I know that so many of us come in with different levels of baggage Maybe from the church, maybe from community, maybe from life. And, and, and what, I, what I loved about her message was it was about seeking without shame, freely able to pursue God and understand more about him. Third week was about knowing. And we talked about knowing isn't just about knowing facts, but knowing intimately, experiencing at a deeper heart level that we can experience God beyond just knowing the details about him. And then last week, Shauna spoke and she talked about loving. She asked this question, 
How are we living loved? When we live love, what happens? And this is where this week, it's just a powerful connection into it because now we get to respond with this idea of obedience. If love is a motivator, this idea of living love is a motivator, how do we act and respond in a way that we're willing to do that for others? So here's my question for you. How can obedience be a response to love? How can obedience not be a response of obligation, but a response to love? So we're going to sit in the book of John, uh, and it's one of my favorite books in the New Testament. And as we've been on this growth cycle of talking about knowing and loving, I love how John's word specifically in the New Testament kind of walks the, through the life of Jesus. Now, if you have been on this series and maybe you're newer in the church setting or maybe you're kind of coming back and asking some questions, what I love about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is these are what are called the gospels and they're an invitation to know more about what Jesus did, how he walked, how he talked, who he talked to, how he showed people love, how he revealed his humanity. And I love as we were talking as a team earlier this week, um, Aaron told me about this one way a friend of ours kind of talked about these four books. He said, these are the people who either hung out with Jesus or hung out with the people who hung out with Jesus. So they have some beautiful words to say. So maybe if you are in this kind of growth journey, maybe your, one of your first steps is to say, I just want to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John one chapter at a time. Maybe every day you go, I'm just going to read one chapter. And I'm just going to ask, who is this Jesus? And what does he desire for me? So we're going to look at John 14, verse 23. John, uh, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. So let's be honest. That word obedience is like a negative word in our culture, right? Like when you hear the word obedience, I don't know what comes into your mind or you hear the word obey. I feel like I hear the words of demeaning uh, that are dehumanizing. I think I'm being talked to like I'm a dog. Like, I, like think about all the different things that you're like, obey, just obey. And I think about it even when I, I've been that person, but some of you are like, yeah, but I said that to my children, me too. Me too. I've, I've said, hey, I need, you to, I need you to obey right now. And then I'm like, that sounds weird. I need you to listen. But what I really mean is I want you to obey whatever I say, right? Like this is what happens. And so I go back in my mind, I go back to this 10-year-old me, right? And 10-year-old me, uh, especially in, in a family where my dad kind of came out of Toledo, uh, first one to go to college, kind of pulls himself up by his bootstraps kind of guy. And then my mom immigrated here from, Ch from Taiwan and, and she had to find her footing in a really difficult automotive world as a Chinese woman and in the C-suite kind of community and conversations. Like I watched them navigate the complexities of it. And guess what? They had a lot of expectations for me. They had expectations about school. They had expectations about not talking back. They had expectations about family. They had expectations that wherever I went, I knew everybody's name and auntie and uncle were absolutely what I called them. Like these were the expectations. Even to the point where I knew this idea of obedience, especially in my culture, in our subculture was very high that one time after I had left my, my job in engineering and supply chain, we're sitting down uh, with my mom and one of her friends and, and then her, uh, her friend's oldest daughter. So me and this girl were like uh, kind of same age, same class. We always would almost like compete but not compete because we didn't want to make each other look bad type of thing. And, uh, and so we're sitting down and, uh, and she says to me, um, the daughter says to me, man, I, Justin, I am, man, this idea to leave your job, to go do something you love, oh, that is amazing. I really want to do that. And, and then as quickly as she said that, her mom chimes in and goes, uh, that is beneath you. But great job, Justin. I love that you're doing it. It was like one of these moments where we just kind of laugh. And I'm like, because it was this expectation that with your degree, with your experience, the only thing is climbing in a certain way. I don't want you to, she was like, I don't want to waste your life, your talents, your gifting. I'm like, I'm right here. I can hear you, <laughs> right? It's one of those moments. Like, I, I know what you're saying to her, but it feels like it's hitting me really good. But this isn't the type of obedience that Jesus is talking about in the scripture. 
Obedience in our human experience sometimes can be like there's a certain expectation that you have to live up to and you cannot deviate from. I think Jesus' invitation to us is something better. When he gives us a vision for our lives, when he, he gives us a vision for how to live and how to talk to people and how to love people, how to serve people, he's saying there is a more freeing way that is better. So I'm not asking you to obey, just to obey. I'm asking you to follow me and see what I have for you. And maybe the longing to be more present, the longing to experience more joy, the longing to allow anxiety to decrease. Maybe if you follow my way, you'll experience all that you long for and more. It may not look the way you thought, but it may be better than you ever dreamed. And I believe this is the type of, of conversation around the word obedience. Because when love, a response to love that is genuine, obedience can be a beautiful response to that love. It can be free of guilt and shame. Think about the things that you do out of love. When, when your spouse or your partner is sick, after you close the door on them so you don't want to get sick, then you start cleaning up a little bit more. You start going above and beyond. You start asking a different question. Maybe you've fallen into, you know, there's certain things that you tackle in the home and they tackle in the home, but when the other is sick, do you notice that it changes? When a friend is hurting, you find yourself dropping everything. When a friend gets a diagnosis, you find yourself shifting your posture, shifting your prayers, shifting your thinking towards them in a different way because it is a response of love. And I know for all of us that we're navigating these complexities. And as, as many of us are getting older and older, actually everyone is getting older and older. That's the way life happens. But as you start getting to the point where you start caring for your parents, you're willing to shift your entire schedule to do so out of love. When love is genuine, obedience can be a beautiful response. And I don't know if there's a greater, greater act of love than this picture. Can we put that one picture of, anybody know what this is? <laughs> if you do not know what this is, this is the greatest act of love that I'm going to teach you about. There is nothing more sacrificial than this act of love. So this is called the nose Frida. And what you do is you stick the nose Frida into your child's nose when they have snot dripping out of their face. And then you put your mouth on the other side and you suck the snot out of their skull. And you hope that that little piece of foam stops it from getting into your mouth. There is no greater act of sacrificial love than this. Can we give it up for the parents who have nose freedom? <laughs> By the way, I got bitter looking this up. I got bitter because now they have electric ones. I'm like, oh, oh my kids are grown up now. What the? Come on. They now know how to blow their nose. I don't have to do this anymore. There's an electric one. You just press the button and it pulls their brains out. <laughs> You'll never forget that act of sacrificial love. I'll tell you that because love... We're getting serious. Love is a powerful mo motivator. Love is a powerful motivator. But one of the things, as we walk through what Jesus is talking about, the kind of love of obeying his teaching, sometimes we get distracted. Sometimes we miss it because not only is love a powerful motivator, so is guilt. So is fear. And so is shame. One of the things that I think Jesus is doing when he's laying out this vision of love and he's laying out how he loves. And he's teaching us over and over about love. He's reminding us in one of the most beautiful ways that not only is love a powerful motivator, but when we get caught looking for, at shame or looking at guilt or looking at fear as being our driving factor in our lives to follow him, we miss out on the one truth that love is the only motivator that can actually sustain our soul. Think about how many things we give our life to that doesn't sustain our soul. That doesn't give us the hope that we've longed for. That doesn't give us the peace that we've longed for. And we keep searching. 
And yet at some point when we understand that when we live love as Shauna talked about last week, then we begin to not only live love, but we allow love to be our response to what Jesus has done in our lives. When we talk about like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whomever believes in him shall not perish but inherit eternal life. When you think about that, that type of love that Jesus offers with his life is the self-sacrificial type of love that allows you to flourish, that allows you to experience hope, that allows you to step out with courage in the middle of fearful moments or guilt filled moments. You're like, I can take this step because I'm not stepping out of shame. I'm not stepping out of fear. I'm not stepping out of guilt. I'm stepping out because I am loved and I want other people to experience that as well. Jesus modeled for us a self-sacrificial love for the flourishing of others. And he invites us to follow him. That's what he's inviting in an act of obedience. Hey, when you find yourself worried do you turn to just worrying more or do you start to trust differently do you start to seek differently do you start to ask jesus about who he is and what he has for your children for your job for your future for your struggle for your concerns for your worries what anchors your soul love is the only motivator that actually sustains our soul So I want you to go back. Can we put up that growth cycle one more time? I want you to think about this with this growth cycle photo. Where do you find yourself right now? Something our team was talking about recently was this idea that we all have a next step. And one of the beautiful things about the growth cycle, it's, un, it's unending. When we, when we realize that there's a place in our life to trust God a little bit more, to seek after him, to, to ask questions about who he is and experience him and experience his love and then ask the question, God, what do you want me to do with it? That's the journey of the growth cycle. And sometimes we want it to be like what we hope the stock market is, up and to the right, and just easy street, right? But that's not the way life works. It's this cycle of up and down and up and down and, and we walk through it over and over again. And that's what this growth cycle is inviting us into. Sometimes it looks differently. Sometimes you realize you're not trusting him. You've been trusting yourself. You've been trusting your own skills. You've been trusting who you are. And God's going, will you seek after me and know that I love you? Will you see how I've loved people on the margins? And will you move towards them? Will you know and experience this love that has given you freedom? And will you offer that to the world? because they long for the same thing you do. When we find ourselves in this growth cycle, we find ourselves at different places with a different next step. But that's the beautiful journey we get to take together because you've taken a step of trust that I have. You've taken a step where you've grown in places that I have. And I wanna learn from you just like you wanna learn from me. It's this mutuality of the kingdom of God interacting with one another. You have wisdom that I don't have. You have experiences that I don't have. And when we move together, we get to experience a more beautiful vision of the kingdom. I think about acts of obedience. Have you ever had a moment where you, you've realized that there's been a temptation, a sin, an area of your life that has become so overwhelming that you, you've been fighting it on your own and you've had to reach out to a friend? When I think about the growth cycle, I think about this moment where I felt like my relationship with Jesus had started to grow distant. And I remember at Man Up, what we call Man Camp, now we're a retreat, but about eight years ago, I went and uh, I looked at my friend Adam and I said, hey, I need you to help me in this area of my life. This area I'm struggling, this area I'm hurting. This area, I'm just, I find myself running into a brick wall over and over again. Will you walk with me? That step of obedience wasn't because I felt great. It's because I wanted to be reminded of what it meant to feel loved and to move forward in that love. And I've watched other men at that retreat do the very same thing and take powerful steps in their lives. I've seen people who take a step into, into a small group here 
and say, I want to be, I want to grow. I want to experience life differently. I want a community. And when they've done that, I've seen them have community that is built that pr presses into their relationship with God. People that they meet, you're like, can you believe it? I met so-and-so and they knew so-and-so and then all of a sudden now we're friends and, and, and then that group starts serving, that group starts building relationships and impacting the community. I've watched that happen. But it always starts with a step. Not of guilt, not of shame, not of fear, but out of love. I watch people go on trips around the world. We had a trip to the border uh, just recently, a, a couple of our team members went down there to help serve some of the communities, both on both sides of the, of the border. We have people who've gone to Nepal just recently to step into the trafficking situation there. We had people who went to Palestine and Israel with us to engage in the community conflict. We have people going out out of these acts of obedience to say, God, where are you leading me? I want to walk with you into the messiness of life, into the difficulty, and I want to love people. Paul, a person who hated Christians, he said this about love because he then ended up becoming one because he realized how loved he was. He said this in 2 Corinthians 5. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all. And those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. Notice how Paul kind of walks through this thought. He's like, there, there is a way to live compelled by the love of Christ. Why? Not guilt, not shame, not fear. Out of the freedom that Jesus offers with his life. And our response to that love is to follow him. And we all know this. You can try harder. You can do more. You can do it because of shame. You can do it because of guilt. You can do it because of fear. I was talking with a friend the other day, and, and she said, I always went to church out of guilt that I wasn't good enough. And what was beautiful is she's learning that that's not who Jesus is. She's learning that Jesus is meeting her in the messiness of her life and teaching her about how he loves her and wants more for her and her family. And she, as she's been on this journey, she's starting to rediscover that love that God offers. So the question that we have, that I have, is how can I respond to love, being Jesus, with love? I want you to wrestle with this this week. How do I respond to the one who loved me, who laid down his life to me, with a response of love? What does that look like? What does that look like in my family? What does that look like in my relationship? What does that look like in my job at the water cooler with that person who annoys me every time? What does it look, do we actually have water coolers anymore? I just, I like said it and I'm like, I don't know if I've seen one of those. But like you think about it and you go in those moments that are difficult in the classroom, when you have a kid who's acting out, how do you respond with love? because you are loved. How do you show people a different vision of life? Because I think what Jesus does is, hey, come follow me, because I'm gonna teach you about the ways in which my love can transform your life and your community. This is the invitation over and over again. I love how Eugene Peterson, theologian, author, writer, he said this, and yet, oh, and yet I decide every day to set aside what I can do best and attempt what I do very clumsily and open myself to the frustration and failures of loving. Daring to believe that failing in love is better than succeeding in pride. Think about this. I want you to look at this. He's saying it's better to daringly try to obey God and follow him in the messiness of life and feeling at it out of love rather than letting our pride be the thing that sustains us. Because we all know we've been down that road. It never lasts. I think Jesus' invitation to us to follow him, to obey him, is a way that even if we fail in love, we still move forward with the beauty of a sacrificial love that is unlike anything else in this world. It's why Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 5.16, at one time we thought of Christ merely 
from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. Notice that word, has begun. Our goal isn't to be successful with prideful, we never fail. Our goal is just to follow, to respond to love with love. So how do we respond to love with love? When you think about that growth chart, and I have the band come up, when you think about the growth chart, I wonder in which one of the, the different moments that you find yourself in, are you able to respond with love right now? And are you finding yourself in a place where you're just not believing? You go, okay, God, what would it mean for me to respond with love to the love that you've given me by just choosing to seek you a little more? To sit in your presence, to listen to your, your scriptures or to a song that encourages your heart. When you think about maybe you've been in a season where you haven't sought Jesus out very much. Or maybe you felt like you hit a brick wall. You might ask God, God, what, what do you want me to know about you? How do you want me to know you? How do you want me to know your love? And would you break down the places in my heart that have grown cold? Because we don't do it out of obligation. We do it out of love. And when we do it out of love, I believe we are able to grow and keep growing and being able to share those moments with one another. When I look out every single time, I see people whose stories have been shaped by love. I see people who are having impact in schools, as teachers, administrators. I see coaches who are loving people on the sideline. I see researchers who are trying to understand the complexity of life and following after them. I see people who have been walking through businesses, managers saying, how do I love the people that I'm with? One of my favorite things is to say is why don't you invite them to see Jesus as you see him, to experience Jesus as you experience him and see how it not only changes your heart, but theirs. How do you respond to love with love? In G Jesus, we are so grateful that you have met us in our mess. And you don't look down upon us. You don't come at us with guilt and shame, overrun us with fear, but you just invite us to belong. You invite us to experience that love and to move out with courage and even fail along the way. Because it's not about whether we're successful or whether we fail at it. It's just the fact that we are faithful to the love that you have offered us to invite other people to experience it as well. So we lift up our lives to you and say, lead us. May we respond to your love with love for our neighbor, for our family, for our friend, for our enemy, for our coworker, for our community, here and across the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, as we are closing out our series and growing, we're going to sing a song together that we sang as a prayer in our first week when we talked about what it looked like to trust as we believe in God. And that response was this simple prayer of, you can have it all, Lord, every part of my world. And as we close out this series and consider what it looks like to obey from a place of the way we have grown in our knowledge and our experience of how deeply God loves us, so that then we will model our lives in following the way of Jesus, the way that he laid out for us in loving submission to the Father. This is our same prayer. You can have it all, Lord. So as we sing these words, I want to invite you to process with God what that might look like for you, what your next step is in this cycle. And as you feel ready, stand and sing with us and let this be your response to God for who he is, what he's done for us, and how deeply he loves you. It's hard. 
together about making room for God in our lives. Let's let this continue to be a prayer of surrender.
know for me, that song has become like an anthem recently in my life. Like, I just, I just want to make room so that I can hear and I can take that step that God is calling me to. And that's my prayer for you. How do we respond with love to love? We make room for God to speak in our lives so that we can follow him. And so I'm praying that, that that's one of the things that you take away from this series. And that begins to impact you daily, weekly, in your home, in your workplace, and in your own hearts. So I pray that that would go with you. Um, Next week, we kick off our Table Talk series. And I will tell you this. I I don't do this often. Uh, This kickoff, uh, my heart for this first week, uh, there is something about it that I think is one of the most foundational conversations we need to have right now. And you know those Table Talk moments. They're important, right? I just, um, I'm inviting you not only to come back, to, but to bring somebody with you because I believe it will be one of the things that sets the tone for this next season. And um, it's going to get messy because it's called the messy table. And uh, that's what we're talking about. And so we want to get a little messy and talk about what does that mean to live in the mess of our lives? Because I don't know about you, my life ain't perfect. Your life ain't perfect. I know that my life isn't perfect. I'll let you judge yours. Um, so that's next week. Invite somebody back. Hang out for Fall Fest. Grab some pizza. Meet some people. But before you do that, if you can help us with two things. One, grab a couple chairs in the back and stack them to help our tech team. And then if you're willing to stay after for 20, 30 minutes and help tear this down, Kyle, our tech director, will be up front. would love to connect with you. God bless you and have a great week. <laughs>